Welcome to World's Finest, the special World's Finest, with the usual suspects, me, Phil, and Lil, of course. Hey, guys. What's so special? Uh, we're about to do an interview with Mr. Uh, Tim Seeley, one of the co, one of the current co-writers of uh, the Grayson book. So, I guess shall we get to it? <laughs> yep, I'm excited. Hello. 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 Hey, what's up, man? Hey, good. How are you? Good, good. Let me just uh, turn up my volume. Make sure you can hear me. All good. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, uh, I'm yeah, I'm Phil and uh, uh, Lilith with me. Hey Tim. Hey hey, how are you doing? Great. Oh, uh, we're excited. We we love Grayson. Uh, it's we review DC Comics every week, and every week Grayson it's my pick of the week every week. Oh, thank you. I so um, well oh, before we get into the big thing, I uh, want to ask you um, were you a big comic comic book fan before you got into the business? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think there's anybody who gets into a business like this without being a fan. You yeah, wouldn't, but... you wouldn't last, you know. You would just be like, "This is stupid," and you get out. <laughs> you have to, you have to have that sort of undying fandom and appreciation and affection. Uh, so I mean, were you like a big uh, Dick Grayson fan or Batman fan back then? Yeah, the day? yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I grew up on on Batman stuff, and I always use the the story I used to illustrate the the Grayson thing is when I was five, my mom ordered me um this mego set because i love spider-man it was like the first comic book character i i I got a comic of and she ordered me this mego set that was supposed to come with the spider mobile you know Uh and it was supposed to come with spider-man and green goblin and when i when we got the toy and i opened up on christmas it came with the hulk and robin i don't know why (laughs) but um so as a kid i was like driving around my web mobile with dick grayson driving um so if that prepared me if anything could prepare me for working on grayson working for spiral it was my days having dick grayson drive the spider mobile hmm. uh let's see uh so was it uh kind of nerve-wracking when uh the, it was decided that uh dick grayson was going to go from nightwing to evolve into uh the you know the agent grayson agent 37 um you know what the only so I have a general sort of anxiety about everything, but on the upside, it never affects me when I'm working on a project because um, I just don't have any ability to think about how much people will hate it. So fortunately, like, I mean, I, I think there was, it crossed my mind briefly, like, oh man, Nightwing fans might not dig on this, but I was so excited about the idea. Um, well, because, you know, the the basic story was, is that I got an email from the editor at the time, Katie Kubert, and she, she and I had worked together on Batman and Rob, Batman Eternal, and we got along really well. And she said, um, hey, they're going to make Dick Grayson a spy. Do you have any ideas for that? And I was like, wow, that is a terrible idea. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, I don't have any ideas for that. And then I went home for the weekend, and then by Monday morning, I was like, holy crap, it's a great idea. Mm-hmm. And I have a total way to make that work. Um, so I wrote up this pitch, like I think within like an hour, and sent it off. And then... Um, you know, I happen to she Katie hired me and Mike Doyle hired Tom King um, because they didn't know who was it was at a time of transition, I guess, in mm-hmm. the office. So Mark, you know, Katie transitioned to a different office and Mark said, uh, hey, man, uh, I hired this other dude and Katie hired you. How about you guys work together? And we're like, all right. And that's kind of how you ended up with the Grace and Creative team that you end up with. Do You think that's why it's such a great book is because there's uh, two heads or two heads better than one. I wouldn't say it's always the case, um, <laughs> but in this book, I think it works because of us. I, I think what I would have done would have been too weird and Tom would have been too dark and it, you get something kind of unpredictable because it toggles between um, our sort of sensibilities, um, you know, and, and I think it's unpredictable because of that. And uh, I also, you know, just in a weird um a thing that never happens tom and i happen to work together really well Mm -hmm. um that's not a thing that i think you can just stick two people together and assume that will happen but that's what happened with us and uh yeah i think the book benefits from the weird combination of the two of us because i mean we get along great but our sensibilities are different our experiences are different um but i think we share the same affection appreciation for the character um and that's kind of what unifies us i think is the a respect for you know what that character stands for and what it what dick grayson means and um what that legacy uh needs to be and i think you know those things unify us into making a book that somehow works despite you know all the factors going into it being sort of against it from the beginning 
Um, yeah, I would say in my opinion, it, it really succeeded because Dick Grayson is my favorite character. And I remember being a little nervous when I heard about the whole, you know, getting rid of the whole Nightwing identity and going to the spy thing. But and like I said, now every month it's my, it's my favorite book. So well, I mean, Tom and I's most common experience at conventions and we can corroborate that this happens whether we're together or separate is that people come up to us, they slap down uh, issue Grayson, and they said. I wanted to hate this, but it's my favorite comic. So, like, the it's clear now, like, had I known sort of what we were up against, I probably would have been paralyzed with fear. Um, <laughs> but I just, like, fortunately, it's just not something, you know, my anxieties about everything in life don't apply to when I make shit up. I, I don't, I'm just lucky that way, I guess. But, um, you know, I mean, and, and to, I think to Tom and I looking back on it, it's, it's sort of a, we just knew inherently what it had to be. You know, and I think sometimes, especially with the character with a 75 year history, I think if you're familiar enough with with what that character needs to be, mm-hmm. you don't have doubts. You just know that this is right, like capital R right. Like this is, you know, we just knew if we're going to do something like this, it had to be in this way um, with this level of respect, but with this level of innovation. And there was just, yeah, it was weird. There was no, there was very little disagreement about that. I have a question about um, when it comes to like character team ups, because I found it really like kind of odd and it works with the Midnighter pairing. Like, was that your idea or is that like DC saying, hey, we're trying to launch Midnighter 2. Could you work that into the story or a little bit of both? No, I mean, it was totally, it was my pitch had Midnighter in it from the beginning. Um, And Midnighter got a book out of the, out of the sort of success of Grayson, actually. Um, which is great. I mean, that makes my day. But um, yeah, Midnighter was in my pitch because I wanted, I, I, I mean, whatever it became, and I think what it became is great, but the initial idea was that um, plopping Grayson into this sort of espionage world, um, it seemed like the Wildstorm character was sort of the best position to take, you know, some of those um, positions uh, because the original Wildstorm universe was sort of a, a lot of the storylines were kind of based on this idea that that superpowers were sort of a um, commoditized, like th- it was basically, you know, the new Cold War was this sort of um, trading in superhuman organs and, and this sort of new new weapons, the new sort of nuclear um, threat was was superhuman. So um, I kind of just dig, dug back into that stuff and I thought that would be a great place to start a espionage story in the DC Universe was, you know, sort of um, using, using those Wildstorm ideas. And I... Midnighter was one of my favorite characters from the old Authority run, and um, combining that with the idea that he's sort of Batman but gay and meaner, <laughs> and um, and also sort of more of like a black ops military version of Batman, um, there was so much story potential there that I couldn't leave it on the table. Like, the, so he was in the original pitch. You know, it's like that was that was something that um, instantly Dan DiDio sort of. Uh, liked because he was like, well, you know, Midnighter can kind of stand for. He, I think Dan described it as the the comedian from Watchmen. He's sort of he's already jaded and he's lived in this world, and then Dick comes into it and tries to sort of you know fun it up and sort of like make it. Um, he adds, you know, Dick comes from the Robin way of dealing with dark darkness, which is to approach it with a sort of swashbuckling smile and and the idea you know, it would be that a guy like Midnight would be like, who is this jerk? And we could have so much fun with that. And I think that's evident in those first issues where, you know, it's all about the interaction between those two guys and, and their similarities and differences. And, and uh, yeah, that was sort of, that was to me one of the most fun things about that first issue. Hmm. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And on the flip side now, I mean, uh, Grayson's made a couple um, appearances in the Midnighter book. Do they come to you for notes or anything and say, you know, does this seem right? The, you know, would he say this? Would he do this? I mean, it's not it's not done that formally. Um, the editors mm-hmm. kind of handle that stuff. But Steve Orlando and I are friends. Um, so, you know, it's it's done informally. It's sort of um, one of the, you know, when, when, um, when Mark Doyle first said, you know, we want to spin a... Um, Midnighter book out of Grayson. He said, we've got this dude, Steve Orlando, and he's got a great idea for it. And then so, you know, Steve and I caught up at the next sort of DC summit and we got along instantly. Um, and we, it was clear we sort of shared the same influences and the same interests, um, especially in that character. So, you know, he and I just talk, I mean, we text on the phone or we, we call each other or we meet up, you know, we just, it's a lot less formal, I think, than people probably think it is. But um, like, I know what Steve is doing with 
or, or with a Midnighter and Dick. And then when I'm writing, when I wrote issue 13, I knew what Steve was doing that month so I could play Midnighter the way Steve was playing their relationship in, in Midnighter. So there you go. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so all, so all the crossover stuff goes through the editors. Like, you have the upcoming Ro, uh, Robin War with like a few different books. Is that all go through the editors? Or yeah, I mean that Robin War is yeah, it's definitely run through the editors. I mean, I know what's happening in Robin War, even though I'm not working on it because it involves my character. So, I mean, my character in quotes. <laughs> um, but it's written by by Tom. So, uh, you know, I've read the scripts and I know I know the outcome. Um, again, yeah, it's on the poor editor who has to coordinate all that stuff to sort of keep us in the loop. And, um, you know, and, and Tom, Tom and I have worked together long enough now and sort of trust each other that even though I, I'm not working on Robin war, he called me and asked for advice on stuff. And then I called him on Batman and Robin eternal. So, um, you know, we keep it coordinated with the help of our able and overworked editors. And then we can kind of do a fair amount of it ourselves too, just because, you know, um, I think we care that it lines up maybe even in a way that doesn't matter to, to them on a corporate level. We care on a sort of story level. Um, so uh, can you drop us any hints on ro- anything about Robin War? Oh, man. I mean, I wouldn't even know where to start. I, I, yeah, I, I mean, I think it's just like to me, Robin War is kind of I think what fans will. It's what fans, I think, of this kind of stuff want now. It's It's a really like. It's an examination of what Robin means and if that's like, you know, and it really kind of it's based on the initial ideas of we are Robin, I think, which is like the activism part of it, you know, um, and sort of the kids taking up this name in the as, as a as a symbol of their activism and trying to make their city a better place. And then like what that means. Um, and it's very Tom King. It's really I mean, if you read Tom stuff, you know, it's really political and really yeah. mm-hmm. sort of. Um, and it's, it's 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 definitely a Tom story. You can it's right through to the bone. It's a Tom King story. Um, I mean, you're one of those people that have like a lot of slashes with their names. You have a penciler, colorist, inker, writer, and a scripter. Uh, does that does that like help you just be able to like finagle? Because you also like obviously you have some created own stuff over at Vertigo. Effigy is like sheer brilliance, by the way. Um, a huge well, fan of that. Thank you. It's actually canceled, but it was fun while it lasted. Yeah, <laughs> it, it fit right in with Vertigo, though. That was that was an unfortunate choice. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I think I'm lucky because I, I'm able to do whatever the hell I want in Revival um, or Hackslash or Two Degree FG, um, you know, and those other things that I make. And then when I come to work at DC, my expectations aren't necessarily like I'll get to tell my opus. And I'll, it'll be untouched and it'll be pure me. Like, I don't have that sort of illusion. Um, and I have another venue to vent that sort of ego. Um, so when I'm working on Grayson or, you know, Batman Rob Eternal, like, I don't, it doesn't bother me to collaborate, you know? Like, I'm not, I'm not sort of asking for those books to be uh, a reflection of my soul, you know, that it's so important and so artistic with a capital A. Like, for me, it's more... You know, this is a job I'm doing. I'm going to enjoy it. It involves characters that I have affection for. Um, but it's not like I'm, you know, I can turn around and draw a cover for something and be like, oh, I got all my demons out on this one. And it's not, it doesn't have to be about nothing. It doesn't, that can be about me and, and Grace and can be about, you know, 75 years of character legacy and whatever the company needs him to be and all that sort of stuff. And it doesn't bother me too much. Anyway, yeah. Well, speaking of that, I mean, you've worked with, you know, DC Proper, Vertigo, also um, IDW and Image. Are all, is like all the business atmosphere the same or is like each place like this like little like niche microcosm of like corporateness? Um, I mean, every company is different, I guess, obviously. But, you know, they're all, I mean, Image is such a unique beast. It doesn't even, it's not even sort of in the same category as other companies, really. But because, you know, other companies have editors and, um, you know, sort of uh, media wings that deal in things other than comics, um, and then Image is just completely its own thing. It's sort of a, it's sort of like a record label to a degree that you sort of, in a way, once they pick you to use to be in their club or be in their brand, you get to use their very valuable label. And but you make the comics and do everything yourself, um, which is completely different than even Dark Horse. Um, you know. So, yeah, it's just a really different approach to making stuff. And, um, 
you know, when you're doing something for, um, for DC, for instance, you're, you're getting marching orders, you're getting, but you're also getting all the support of, you know, an editorial staff and a production staff. And, and really all you are there for is typing monkey. And, um, when you're working an image, you're, you're, it's really, you're doing everything and you're turning that over to someone who, you know, helps make your project get to the store shelves. Um, so yeah, very different animal. But yeah, you were talking about Batman and Robin Eternal. Is that like incredible pressure, a weekly series, or do they insist that you have like so many like weeks or months ahead of time done before they release it? Uh, well, I mean that's ideal. But <laughs> you know, in Batman, Batman Eternal, we had a we were a lot. We we were way ahead of the game, and we were sort of it was lower pressure. Um, but yeah, Batman and Robin Eternal is a little bit a little bit more. Um, you know, it's, it's it's kind of done a little bit looser. Uh, not quite as far ahead. Um, but I mean, the job is just to, you know, you, the editor in that case is really, really important. Chris Conroy, who's doing Batman and Robin Eternal, did the, the half, the back end of uh, Batman Eternal. So he's unbelievably good at this shit and he's juggling so many things. Um, so in, in this case, it's really just up to us to turn in scripts. Um, and all that other stuff is handled off in Burbank by a bunch of, you know, over over scheduled, overworked, sweating editors and um so yeah i mean it's it, and we just have to work together so a big part of batman robin terminal is you know me being uh available to talk to all the other writers and um the editors and scott and, and james and specifically james uh, is a big guiding force on this one so i mean this you know i mean that was the all uh, lesson of the first eternal was you know put put your ego away like you're part of a team and you're you're there to serve the story and you know, you don't get to um, scream and cry and make sure it's done exactly the way you want to. You're, you're there to make it work best for the team. So yeah, it's communist comics. It's, it's pretty great. <laughs> yeah. That was gonna be my next question is, is, uh, is everyone coming to you and Tom on this one since it's a, such a huge grace and centric story? Yeah. I mean, that's kind of what I think Tom and I's function on. And that's kind of why we're split up is, you know, um, he's doing Robin war to be the sort of, the dick manager and I'm on, um, you know, on, on Batman and Robin Eternal to be the, the, the same job and, and just sort of, obviously there's other characters in there, but when it's so much focused on, you know, the new position of, of Grayson in the DCU, like then it has to be, those guys are really cool about wanting to coordinate it with us and making sure that it fits with our series. And, um, you know, and obviously like we made all that crap up. So, so when, you know, they want to uh, do something with this story. They say, well, what, what do you think? How would this work? And um, so, yeah, that's kind of partially our jobs too, I think, is to to guide these multiple writer arcs, you know, which is, it's fun for me because I don't, I mean, there's only a few things where I'm like, this has to be this. Otherwise it's up to the, you know, go crazy, do your own thing. You may inspire a story for us. Um, and, but there's only a few things that like, I think both Tom and I are like, Nope, can't change that. That is absolutely necessary. Um, you know. Speaking of all those moving parts, um, I felt like Batman um, Eternal, and I don't mean this in a bad way, was kind of like a spinoff machine. You know, well, not even a spinoff machine. Just like, hey, we've got Wayne Manor. Hey, we've got Catwoman. Is that like a corporate thing, or was that just organic? And in the same way, uh, you know, you had uh, We Are Robin and Batgirl in the last, like, uh, Batman and Robin Eternal issue. Was that organic or kind of like, hey, they have the, these issues out this week. Can we coordinate it with that? Oh, I mean, it's not that coordinated. It's not like it's, there's no way for us to be like, hey, you put this character in there. It'll, coord- it'll you know, it'll line up with their storyline and help boost sales. Like, it's impossible. It would be. We have to plan things, and if you do a weekly, you're so it's such a different scheduling um, than a monthly book. So, um, you know, I mean, for us, it's if you're doing a book set in the Bat Universe, you know, you kind of want to reach out and and be able to use all those great elements for the story. So, like um, the first Batman Eternal, the job was to sort of raise all the ships to a degree. Like, you know, this is a celebration of Batman in his 75th year, and let's make sure everything that we do is sort of a uh, explanation and celebration of what makes Batman work. And that includes all the characters that have been developed in that universe, you know, um, whereas Batman Robin Eternal is more of um, sort of extension of, you know, it's, it's obviously a celebration of Robin because it's also Robin's 75th anniversary this year. But the, in this case, I think it's more um, 
it's very it's much more story dictated and it's all the stuff that we slip in there none of it is extraneous so um all that stuff has a function later we, we are robin's appearance Batgirl, all that stuff has a, a function towards the larger you know tale really loving the cassandra kane stuff though keep it up just saying <laughs> I mean, see, so for me, I, that's not a character I'm familiar with. Um, I mean, I'm now, but I wasn't because that stuff came out when I was in college and I didn't have money to buy a bunch of... I, I was mostly reading, like, you know, um, collections and old comics and stuff at the time, so I missed that era of Batman. Uh, that's... But I I mean, obviously, now I'm well-researched, but for me, that that was a education, you know, to go back to the 90s and do some Batman research. So there seems to be like a whole plot in Batman and Robin Eternal about, uh, you know, maybe Batman was plotting something. Are we going to be shocked by what we what we learn? I mean, I'm not going to ruin it for you. I well, mean, I think the... <laughs> yeah, yes or no, are we going to be shocked? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think the, the idea there is to challenge, you know, I think it, it's almost sort of, a, I thought the initial idea was so great because it's such a meta commentary because there's this weird obsession, I think, uh, by society to look back on stories like Batman and Robin and be like, Oh my God, he endangered a minor. It's like, no, it's not what that's about at all. I mean, Robin was developed to, to be this sort of, you know, kids wanted to wish they were alongside Batman fighting mm-hmm. evil. And so the idea obviously is that he's your entry point. He's, you wish that some in the night Batman would say, I need your help. And you're going to help me kid. And you're like, yay. And, and that's what Robin has always been. But then, as we, you know, as people get more cynical and sort of maybe, you know, forget that these are fantasy, they start to wonder about, you know, is he making child soldiers and, and um, you know, what's the morality of this? It's like, it's, it's not real. So this is kind of a, a poke, I think, at that expectation, you know, the, the weird sort of tendency to add reality to something which is clearly, you know, um, fantasy fulfillment, right? Like, I mean, you know, there's no actual minors harmed in the making of a Batman comic. So uh, I think that's kind of what, what that story is about. It's a, it's a parody s- satirical approach to society's expectations of what these stories be and, and sort of making people ask, you know, well, what if it was that case? What if this story was about the fact that Batman made child soldiers, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, that question has been asked as far back as Dark Knight Returns, right? I mean, that's, that's the, that was the point of, um, uh, Carrie O'Kelly is, is, is she is sort of, you know, um, she, is she an activated soldier by Batman? He actually says good soldier. I mean, it's like, it's right there, but yeah, I mean, it's all sort of, you know, playing with those expectations. But, uh, while you're talking about, uh, people putting re- you know, real world expectations on these fictional characters, uh, can we address the, uh, elephant in the room, the Grayson 13 controversy, which honestly, can you explain it to me? Cause I don't know if I fully understand it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, um, I mean, there's been a certain contingent of the, the readership of Dick Grayson fans and Nightwing fans and stuff that since the very beginning, when we started Grayson, um, have sort of been vocally op- opponents of, I guess what, what they see. And, and I mean, to degree, I see this too is, the sort of sexualization of the character and exploitation. Um, and so one of the things that Tom and I really wanted to do with Grayson was, you know, Dick Grayson is one of the few characters, um, male characters in, in superhero fiction that has a sort of active and rabid female fan, you know, fan following. Um, I think the other one we decided was probably Loki, but from the Avengers movie only. Right. So, um, <laughs> you know, what's up? So there's this sort of like, but there's, you know, there's this very, very vocal and, and sort of, um, and I think that's great. I mean, so one of the things we wanted to play into when we started the book was to play, you know, sort of standard spy tropes um, about exploitation and especially those James Bond sort of ideas of the femme fatale and, and the, you know, objectification of, of female characters and stuff. And just sort of like make fun of that in Grayson while also giving, well, also reveling in it, like. And I learned this from doing Hack Slash, which is one of my favorite things to do. And I think it's a awesomely subversive way to tell stories to make fun of something while being that thing. And, and in Hack Slash, the case was, you know, let's make fun of exploitive, sleazy slasher stories while being a sleazy, exploitive slasher story. Um, and so we wanted to bring that to Grayson. And I think, you know, we I, to agree we're doing something that is sort of unexplored 
uh, in superhero comics, which is to make something um, a, a superhero comic for the female gaze, um, to make something that uh, revels in exploitation and sexuality to a degree, and does so with sort of a weak, you know, wink and a, um, a you know, a smile. And so, but we graded against a certain percentage of readership who thought, who doesn't want sexuality in their comics, who doesn't want um, cheeky exploitation uh, in their comics. And then there was even a sort of smaller but very vocal group who thought that this was actually a form of abuse to the character, um, that the exploitation was sort of demeaning and dehumanizing. Um, and so that sort of came to a head with issue, with issue 13. And we had a preview of 13, which showed the first two pages, um, which in issue 12, Dick goes back to Gotham. Mm-hmm. And he's reunited with the Bat family, who believes he's dead. And then at the end, Spiral comes to him and says, okay, you know, we let you see your family, but now you need to return to work. Um, and they kind of threaten him and say, we know, you know, that Bruce Wayne was Batman, and if you don't come back to us, we'll reveal that to the world, and he's defenseless, and that probably won't go well for him. So Dick is again making the sacrifice. So the issue 13 starts with him in Spiral um, being basically giving a physical to determine if he picked up anything while he was in Gotham. And uh, there's a scene in which he's basically, I mean, you don't see anything, but he's naked. And there's mm-hmm. the resident scientist who's a creepy, who's supposed to be the sort of creepy mad scientist called Dr. Nets. She's giving him what appears to be a sort of overall exam. And <laughs> um, in the script, he says, well, be careful with that thing. Uh, as she's sort of giving this examination. And at one point she says, oh, I found a transmitter. And then she says, nope, it's just a mole. And the idea was to sort of, I mean, I look back at my script and I, the idea and the intent was to show that Dick is a guy that used to have a secret identity. He used to be Dick Grayson and Nightwing on the side and those things were separate and he lived, you know, mm-hmm. this sort of uh, double life. And now all those things are laid bare. And when he goes back to Spiral, he has no privacy. He actually says in the story, yeah, integrity and, spir- and privacy, I'm sure. And, you know, while he's being, you know, sort of uh, shook down and, and uh, you know, exposed, right? Mm-hmm. So, but a per- certain percentage, and specifically one Tumblr blogger and, and her friends, um, really got angry about it um, and sort of took to Tumblr and wrote some pretty, you know, very uh, personal and very, uh, very impassioned opinions about how... In their opinion, I was objectifying um, the character and basically making light of sexual abuse and uh, molestation, um, which they made some arguments towards me, you know, like, this is what you're doing. And, um, you know, so that's sort of that's the beginning of (laughs) of the story. It's kind of complex to explain, but basically to them, I was objectifying and molesting this character and making light of what what they perceived is I was making light of their own traumas. Uh, and I believe the one, one of the women, you know, said that she was triggered by it and actually had a panic attack from reading the comic. Um, so I think, I guess they wanted me to know what, what they thought of that. And so it began this Twitter conversation, which I'm sure is the thing you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, it, it, the whole thing made, I mean, it made sense to me, you know, spiraled want to be thorough. And I mean, Dick Grayson, I mean, we've seen this, you know, he, he's he been, you know, women have been attracted to him. We've seen it, you know, outright like this for, what, at least 10, 15 years. I'm, like I said, I'm the hugest Dick Grayson fan, and, and the whole thing made sense to me, so. Well, I mean, and that's the question, you know, is obviously um, intent versus, you know, what people perceive and um, obviously yeah. perception. And, and uh, you know, and it's interesting to have watched that go, go the conversation happen because, you know, I, you know, I, I understand that one of the things that makes comics great is that people are reading panels, and in between the panels, you get to decide what happens. It's sort of, if I've learned anything about working in comics as long as I have, it's that what happens between the panels is often extremely important to the reader, and in fact, can be more important than what was written in the panel. And I think that's one of the reasons comics have sort of managed to, especially superhero comics, have, have managed to... Um, survive so many societal upsets in technology and um, preference of medium. But because I think to a large degree, the sort of interaction that comics ask the reader to take makes them more personal. Um, And you see that with superhero characters all the time, especially, 
you know, I mean, there's a reason that Hollywood wanted to tap into that affection, you know, that, mm-hmm. my God, these people will read the same character their entire life. Um, Hollywood wishes they had films that people cared about that much, you know, character film characters that, that consistently brought people back that that long, you know? I mean, those characters outlast the most popular TV show on, on air last 12, 13 years, except for Simpsons, obviously. But, you know, they wish they, they had more of that sort of stuff. So, yeah, I mean... There was a lot of reading into it that things that didn't occur. Um, one one person uh, tweeted me with, you know, how can you not be ashamed of yourself? You have someone grabbing Dick's <laughs> and pulling on it and making light of it. And I was like, what? <laughs> and and it's interesting because I think a, a large part of you know, and also um, these the the Tumblr generation is used to reacting to images, mm. and I think in some cases they're reacting only to panels. Um, and so like to see them take things out of context, I think they're getting a lot of things that aren't there. I mean, to a degree, that's totally okay. But it, I think the argument that um, some of these people wanted to have with me was to say, admit you did something wrong and tell us you're going to do better. And I don't think I did anything wrong. Um, I, I understand. I understood the argument and I, I was like, okay, you know, your interpretation is valid. It's not what I intended. I don't think I did anything wrong with a capital W. Um, you know, I think I told the story that I thought was necessary to tell. I thought the value of the metaphor of Dick stripped of his own privacy and integrity was important to the scene. Um, and thus, I don't think I am making light of molestation. I don't think I'm making light of sexual abuse. And I certainly uh, did not intend to trigger anyone. Um, and But I can't do anything about that. I mean, personal personal experiences are going to you know, play into everything someone does. And I, I have no ability to um, control that. That's just not something I can do. So the, I think the interesting part came in almost, you know, yes, we can have the conversation, but the unrelenting desire to make me admit I did something wrong when I wasn't going to do that, um, which is, I think, where the conflict came in. You know? Yeah. So, so, I mean, I think it's worth having those conversations. I, I think it must be frustrating for people, especially, I think, some of these kids and I don't say kids derogatory, like as if to put them down, but I think that they are generally um, all generally under 23, let's say um, they grew up in the echo chamber of the Internet. So I think, you know, they, they once they hear something enough and it's repeated back and forth and it's sort of kept in this community, it becomes fact. And then um, when you present it to someone who says, well, that's not fact, that's your opinion, it almost comes across as an attack. And I think they're not used to being challenged in that way. So it was really interesting to be on the side of that and say, okay, yeah, I hear what you're saying. It's not what happened, but I understand what you're saying. And them just to be like, not understand that. It was kind of interesting. Ah, uh, social yeah, media, just... the double-edged sword. <laughs> sure, I mean, and you know, it, it, this kind of thing isn't new per se. I mean, you know, I'm sure, you know, there were conversations when Robin when Dick Grayson as Robin turned into Nightwing where people were so angry and they couldn't believe that, you know, I mean, this happened. It, people were invested in Robin and, you know, there was angry people mm-hmm. and they hated it. And the thing is they lived in a world where you vented that maybe, you know, maybe at a bar or to a friend or at, at most through some kind of mailing list, you know, or something like that. Um, but now when you don't like something, you can find people who don't. Um, on the internet, you have instantaneous communication and gratification. And yeah, I think it's just, a, it changes the, uh, and also it's easy to find the authors that, you know, it was a Saturday night. My girlfriend was asleep in my lap. My phone starts blowing up. Um, we had just watched some horror movies and all of a sudden I'm like, why am I getting all these tweets? What's going on? No. And I checked my Twitter and it was full. I mean, there was like, I think there was like 50, maybe over the course of, you know, the first I think they must have decided on this Tumblr account to confront me about this. Um, and so my t- my Twitter information was given out and I, they must have sort of coordinated it to, to confront me about it. Um, and so I was like, what the hell is going on? And so I was like, I'm going to go along with this conversation and be honest and, you know, not condescending and just be like, I'll hear your, co- hear your, your complaint. That's, that's fine. Um, now I'm not sure being available is good. <laughs> <laughs> like looking back at it, I'm not sure because I mean there was a time where you know if you were pissed about you know Robin becoming Nightwing, maybe you sent a letter to DC and it got filtered through the letters page and maybe Marv Wolfman heard about it. Um, 
And and then other cases, you went to a convention and walked up to Marvin and said, I hate that, you know, Robin became Nightwing and screw you. And, and then Marv was like, oh, bummer, man, and went off and had a beer with George Perez and they <laughs> didn't give a shit. Or they, you know, I don't know. I mean, there's <laughs> – so it's changed. I mean, obviously the interaction of this kind of thing has changed. So, yeah. Yeah. In a weird way, I think it's it's – well, it's – kind of complimentary because it's like you're an artist and that's i think the the main thing is your art should elicit a response i mean most of it's good and you know sometimes if you get this i'm, I'm sure it doesn't feel good but I, th- I think it's better than if you know your work you know people didn't care yeah i would say that that's true i would i would also say the downside and what i was not super comfortable with was that you know i'm fine with a conversation i'm fine with people criticizing the work i'm fine with all that sort of thing what I think it where it went wrong was um, and where I was uncomfortable was that some of once I, I I was, you know, trying to have the conversation and say I was standing by my stuff and I was not afraid to stand by. But I think there was a percentage of them that wanted to goad me into saying something that they could use like out of context to be like, you know, and there's this thing which is pressure, pressure, push, push until he says something. He snapped. And I'm fine with people saying I don't like the way this guy writes. I don't like the way he writes his character. That's fine. But I mean, there's a, you know, there's a Tumblr blog out there now where someone's saying Seely hates women. He clearly wouldn't help a woman who is in distress. Um, that stuff is, that hurts me personally because that's about me personally. And I know that's not true. Um, but I mean, you know, that's the job and I can't, the sort of way that people take this creative stuff I can't control that. You know, I just have to live with that. And hopefully I don't have to get a real job someday and someone look me up on the internet and be like, oh, this woman says that you're, a, you know, a hater of women and that you would, you would, you know, turn down their helm. Like, oh, that's, that's not good. But I mean, you know, it's <sighs> the separation of that. And I don't like that they are writing, you know, Dick Grayson, not as a superhero, but a spy. That's different stuff. But I think those things get um, mixed into the same bucket of hate. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I think it's just, it's just the downside of working on this character that like so many people love, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and not every character that people love has this kind of fan. Oh yeah. You know, organization. There's characters that sell way more books that don't have this kind of dedication, you know. Um, and I think partially it's some characters people are just okay with interpretations of, and some. I mean, one of the most sort of, I don't know, like it, it affected me. Um, but I had to sort of recognize what it was, was, you know, at some point, one of the angry tweeters at me was saying, you know, I've been a fan of this character and part of this um, community since I was 12, you know, and that's, um, I've never felt, you know, like I couldn't relate to the character before. And that's your fault. (laughs) And I mean, yeah, it it, it may be. I mean, but I I don't, I don't know that that's something I could do. I, I can't, you know, then, then the question is, well, maybe you just don't like it and go buy back issues. I don't know. I don't know what to tell someone in that case. Like, you know, uh, you have your preferences, you have your view on this character. It doesn't mean it's right with a capital R. It just means that's yours. That's your interpretation. That's your personal, your personal thing. Um, it's a fictional character. I mean, I can no more, you know, sexually assault a, a, or, or ruin a, a fictional character, you know, then I then I can expect that I will get it right every single time for every person, right? I mean, it's just yeah, yeah it's very interesting, and it's you know. Well, that was my metaphor before about being an artist. It's like that's your interpretation, you know. You know, people don't paint. You know, if you're a painter, you don't. You know, the same two people don't paint a tree the same way. It's your interpretation. Sure. Yeah, and there's always going to be it. You know, it's yeah. I mean, it's just. It's an interesting point in culture, I guess, is is about it, as much you can say about it. It's like, you know, culturally we're at some kind of, um, you know, a crossing point between sort of uh, social media and the entitlement of the fans who support stuff and, um, and you know, the ability of the creator to tell the story they want to tell. We're at some kind of weird nexus, and I'm not sure where it's going to shake out, you know. Hmm. So, but yeah, Tim, just let me tell you, uh, I'm a 37 year old man. I've been reading comic books since I was 10 years old. And like I said, this is my favorite book every month. Well, I appreciate that. I mean, that, that's all I can try to do, you know, like mm-hmm. <laughs> that's, that's the, it's, it's always going to be a balance of that. And, um, 
And obviously I don't own the character and Tom doesn't own the character and Mikhail doesn't own the character. So we just need to tell the thing that speaks to us and hope that it speaks to enough people. You know, it's a business to keep buying the book and making the character profitable and making the character potentially relevant. I mean, that's I guess that's probably the hardest part for people is when a character who is, you know, a long term uh, popular character changes um, and that becomes the it you know, with, with it becomes the, the person who doesn't like the change forgets that often the reason that they first liked the character was that it changed to meet their generation's expectations. Sure, you know, like, you know, there are people who obviously forget that Dick Grayson was not always Nightwing. They're like, you know, he was he was fucking Robin for a long time, for way longer than he was Nightwing. Um, so, you know, but they only see it as like, well, it's been this way my entire life, but we have to change things to make them relevant. That's just, you know, life... And the world changes, and that's just, you know, it's a response. And hopefully you get it right, and if you don't, you try again. Well, yeah, I mean, especially with characters like, you know, you know Dick Grayson and Batman who have been around for 70-some years. Right, yeah. And, you know, I mean, a lot of – and that's the other thing I think people forget is that there are plenty of characters who who didn't make the cut, who who didn't um, – they're, 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 they were no longer relevant. I mean, it's happened to so many – so many characters and you know the fact that any of these characters sort of are able to um transcend their original origins partially has to do with how flexible and interpretable they are you know um Mm -hmm. and obviously the one of the strengths of dick grayson or batman or superman um is their ability to adapt to a new era you know and take on you know new uh, a new generation of readers and and their concerns and their world you know i mean it's there's a a pretty much scientifically slash marketing proved um, thing where Batman and Superman toggle between popularity based on the, on the going on ons of the world. You know, when people are more cynical about authority and they're more, um, uh, more afraid, they tend to like Batman. And when there's an optimism and a sense of, you know, the future is bright and there's so much we can um, fight for, then Superman's more popular. I mean, that's, that's really important. And that's like, you can't, you know, that's something you can't prepare for or try to control. Yeah. Hmm. I know you're a super busy guy, but in you have like you have done like such a diverse range of like comic books. Like, do you have a diverse range of? Are, can, do you have time to read the books? And if you do, what are you reading? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, Mike Norton and I were just talking about this at lunch about how hard it is to read um, read comics for fun when you're really busy making them. But um, yeah, I mean, I try. I try. I, I, um, I have to read so much stuff for to kind of keep up with the DC stuff um, and to know what characters are doing what. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I I really enjoyed and and not just because he's my friend, but uh, Tom King's Vision Number One was awesome. I think that was a phenomenal take on that character and that artist uh, Gabriel Walto was fantastic. Um, yeah, and I still read a lot of Image and stuff books. I mean, Savage Dragon is still one of my favorite comics. Um, and I, you know, I read a lot of stuff in trade. Um, anything that like, I mean, there's a bunch of creators. I'll just follow to whatever they do. So um, I'll read whatever Grant Morrison does. I'll read whatever Warren else does. Um, I'll read whatever Craig Thompson does. I just kind of follow those people to where they make comics because they make good comics. Totally agree. Cool. Is there is there one character that you'd you'd love to work on? Uh, DC, Marvel, or Image? Anybody? Is there one character you'd you'd love to work on more than anything? Um. I I feel like I've kind of I've been doing this long enough that I've kind of covered all my bases. Like, okay. you know, I got, I've I was a kid. I was like, if I could work on He Man, I would be done, and I've done that. So I know. Um, <laughs> and then like, you know, I always wanted to do. I guess I, I don't know. I always loved Batman, so working on Batman was a big one. Um, yeah, you know, it just seems like the longer you work in comics, you sort of tick them off. Um, you know, like I got to. I mean, it ha- it's not out yet, but I got to work on Blade, which is definitely something as a teenager I always wanted to do. Um, and yeah, it's weird. I mean, there's still, I don't have like a big burning desire one left over. I always loved Spider-Man. Um, he was the first comic book I ever, comic book superhero I ever read. Pretty much the first comic book character I read. So I'll always have a thing for Spider-Man. But I don't, at this point, like I, <laughs> the older I get, the more unsure I am that I'd have tons of ideas for Spider-Man. But then I don't think I thought I'd have tons of ideas for Batman. And I do. So, um, so I mean, yeah, I guess Spider-Man, I, I think he's always, he's always one. Um, Would you team him up with the Hawk in a Spider-Man car? 
What's that? I said, would you yeah, team him up with the the Hulk and his Spider Man <laughs> car? They drive around town. He's a billionaire yeah, now. Exactly. <laughs> I think Dan is bringing back the Spider Mobile. So, uh, oh yeah, he I, did. He did, yeah. So then I'd have to. Yeah. You know, he took all my ideas. I got nothing. <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> he doesn't have the web flinging spider car from Mego. I don't. I don't have the idea. But um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's 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 weird. It's like I think when I was younger and sort of more like, oh my god, I have so many ideas and I'm bursting at the seams and let me do all the things and. And then after a while, you're sort of like, you know, uh, I don't know, it changes a little bit. Uh, not that I lack enthusiasm. I just, I think uh, anything, given anything, I could probably make it work. That's probably what it's become. Like, given anything, I could probably figure out something. Even if I'm not like, I think as a kid, I would have said like, or I mean, and it's when I say kid, I say, I mean, under 30, but I, I would have probably been like, oh my God, I have so many ideas for all these things that I love. And I want to do the things that I love. And now it could be like, I don't know, give me whatever. I'll make it work. I mean, give me, you know say like oh i want you to do a mini series about the x-men character toad and i'd be like all right i'll make that work just i think that would be more interesting to me than than maybe since i've gotten to do all the things that you know made me geek out that's probably a disappointing answer because i think everybody always wants to be like dude i have this idea for you know i mean i guess you know what honestly i'd like to do more with superman uh just because i think that's the gold standard of superhero comic characters so um I have an idea for Superman, so maybe that's the key, you know. Well, there you go. So you have anything else, Lola? Nope, nothing at all, sir. Okay. Well, thank you for your time, Tim. Uh, would yeah. you like to promote anything, or? Um, let's see. Yeah, uh, you can. Get, well, obviously, you guys are doing Batman stuff, so you can get Grayson. Uh, it comes out every month. Uh, it also ties to Batman, Robin, Eternal, and Robin War, which are both uh, November, December area books, I think. And then um, Revival is my image comic. comes out every month. 35 comes out in end of November. And that's a good one. I, I wish people would who would read Grayson were like, I like your shit, would go read Revival. That would be nice. Um, and then, uh, yeah, other than that, read Tom King's Vision. It was really good. Yeah. I highly recommend it. It was. And uh, read Steve Orlando's Midnighter. That's a great book. Yeah, it is. And those are books, yeah, I think they could use the love and they deserve more than they get, you know. All right. Uh, well, thank you very much, Tim. Thank you. Well, if you want to get a hold of us, especially if you're a DC Comics creator and you'd like and you'd like enjoyed this interview and you'd like to be interviewed by us, uh, you can email us worldsfinestpod at gmail dot com on Facebook, where facebook dot com slash worldsfinestpodcast, and on Twitter, we're at worldsfinestpod. Awesome. And well. Uh, you guys should know by now you can find me on Twitter um, being nice to the creators by the way at Lil Health, uh, Fire. Um, I'm on Tumblr and I'm a nice Tumblr person it's lilfire.tumblr.com <laughs> and of course my website uh, lilfire.com and don't forget to check out uh, southgatemediagroup.com for our list of 80 plus yes 80 plus podcasts from everything from animated wrestling and anything else you could probably imagine and you can find me kissing the butt of creators um, on Twitter at Nightwing PDP. And you can email me uh, Nightwing PDP at gmail.com. And if you have any ideas for our big uh, upcoming DC versus Marvel uh, crossover uh, debate podcast, yeah. All New World's Finest. <laughs> <laughs> All New World's Finest roundup, yeah. <laughs> Between uh, Lilith and Charlie as with me as final decision maker <laughs> and parent. I don't know. Uh, just let us know so well, I guess that's it remember to tune in to the world's finest